Amen. You can be seated. Over the next few months, we are going to do a deep exploration together about the gospel, this good news that is at the heart of the Christian faith. The gospel is the the center of our proclamation. And without the gospel, there would be no church, no Christians, no message, and no witness. Let me give you four quick reasons for doing this together. First is quite simple. It's to hear some good news. I know in in many ways, in light of the 20th anniversary of September 11th, that yesterday, and really this whole week, has been kind of hard. Seeing those images, some of you, I'm sure, had very personal stories connected to that day. And uh, and just a sense of reliving that moment is challenging. But that, that comes on the heels of 18 months, quite honestly, that have been fairly difficult for all of us in the pandemic. And on top of that, there's been the cultural, political, and social upheaval And on top of that, the international crises, what's going on in Afghanistan, Haiti, and other places. So it's good to remember as we gather together week after week that we are a people first and foremost who believe in the good news. We're a good news people. And if ever there's a time that we need to hear the good news, I would say this is one of them. This is a time for that. A second is to uphold the one true foundation for life. Michelle Williams, the dean of the Harvard School, Chan School of Public Health, said earlier this year, the past year has been terribly damaging to our collective mental health. There is no vaccine for mental illness. And that's true. And not only has it been difficult on our mental health, and I think most think that those effects of the pandemic are going to increase rather than decrease in the coming months, But there's just a sense in which all that we've been walking through has caused a lot of us to evaluate the foundation upon which we have built our lives. There's a lot of searching going on, a lot of questions, a lot of reevaluation, and maybe even for some of you here this morning, a a new openness, maybe that's what brought you here, to considering the claims of Jesus. And so part of the point of digging into the gospel is to uphold to one another and to all of you who come and join us to to uphold this one true foundation for life. The gospel is the only foundation upon which we can build lives that will never erode or be washed away by the circumstances of our world. Third reason is to strengthen unity together. A few weeks ago, I talked about the pressures in the world that are polarizing uh, in the culture. And those same polarizing pressures are going on in the church, not just here, but all around the world. And to focus in on this good news that's at the heart of our faith is, I hope, to have the impact upon us as a body that draws us more deeply together because we're affirming that which is at the the center and the heart of who we are. And it brings us stronger and helps us to walk more faithfully and to maintain that unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, which does require effort to maintain. And fourth reason is to, to strengthen our mission. Because this gospel, this good news of God, which is at the heart of our faith, is really what gives us our marching orders as the people of God. We have been called by God into his family to join him on the mission that he has going on in the world. And that mission is shaped by the very content and essence of this gospel. And as we look at its content and at its results as well, we'll, I hope, become clearer about what it is that we are called to be and to do as one body here in the city of Boston and around the world. Our text for the series is Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. This introduction to the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans. This is a letter that was written about somewhere in the late 50s, about 25 years after Jesus lived, died, and was resurrected. And to be clear, uh, the entire letter of Romans is an exposition and exploration of the gospel of God. Paul plums the depths of the sacrificial death of Jesus in chapter 3. He talks about the way of faith under our father Abraham in chapter 4. In chapter 6, he explores the liberating power of the gospel to liberate us from the power of sin and bring us under Jesus as king. And and then in chapter 8, he talks about the cosmic scope of the redemption of God, that all creation is groaning longing for the redemption of the sons of God and this cosmic picture of what God is doing. And then in chapters 12 and 13, he calls us to the way of love and to live that out. So all of that to say, these first 17 verses don't cover the whole 
they're an introduction, but they're a, a valuable and helpful introduction for us into this vast and central topic of the gospel of God. Because we're going to spend some time in these texts, in this text for the next few months, you have, uh, I hope, memory cards that were put on your pews. And uh, if you haven't seen them already, I'd, I'd encourage you to grab one. I will make this clear. This is not just for the children. Memorizing scripture is something that I think is really valuable for us as the people of God. The psalmist in Psalm 119 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And because we're going to spend some time in, this, in these texts, I picked two sections of verses 1 through 17. Verses 1 through 7 and then again verses 16 and 17. And they're on the front and back of that card. So take that card, stuff it in your bag or your wallet, carry it around with you. Work on it with your family, but let's memorize these two passages from Romans 1 together in the coming weeks. There are three main questions about the gospel that we'll address from these 17 verses. Where did it come from? Those are source questions. What is it about? Content questions. And what does it accomplish? Results questions. So that's our plan, to look at the source of the gospel, at the content of the gospel, and at the results of the gospel. And digging into these topics will, I hope, increase our confidence in the gospel, will deepen our delight in the God of the gospel, and shape our expectations of what the Christian life is all about. So we'll begin today at verse 1, with our first of two looks at this question of the source of the gospel. Where does the gospel come from and how does it get to us? Questions of origin are important in many different areas of life. Consider food and drink. We are apparently, if I'm reading the culture right, as interested as, as we ever have been as a species in the origin and source of the food that we eat. Many of you will know that Chipotle's platform has been that they only use free-range beef and pork and sustainably grown food. Or consider the farm-to-table movement that is overrunning local restaurants. How many of them that you walk into have a sign on the wall that tells you where the steak you're going to be eating came from somewhere in New England. And the whole point of this is that they want their customers to know what they're putting into their body is healthy and, and as fresh as it gets, because we care about what we put into our body. The chain around that started in Boston in 2003, Be Good, their tagline is food with roots. And again, they're similar in this approach. Or think about the water industry. If you just go to the Fiji Water website or the Avion website, you will notice that they put a lot of effort into communicating to you the source of where their water comes from. And they hire hydrogeologists to wax eloquently about this glacier water that has gone down into the earth that comes straight into the bottle and gets to you and is good for you. So if source matters in food and drink, does it not matter much more when it comes to our soul? To matters of divinity and what is the human life all about? This isn't just about our physical health. It's about the depth of what we understand the world to be, ourselves to be, and of course at the center of who God is. And these things shape us deeply. So my contention is if you're going to give yourself to something, and I shouldn't say if, because you will and already have given yourself to something. It's an impossibility not to as a human being. If you're going to worship something, and we will, because we were created as worshiping beings. If you're going to buy into a particular vision of human flourishing, of what the good life is, then my appeal to you is that you want to know that the source is right and pure and true. And Paul understands this, and so he opens this, probably what is perhaps the most reflected upon letter that's ever been written, he opens with these words, if you'll look with me at verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. 
He states three things in this verse, and this will be the only verse that we explore together this morning. Three things as he introduces himself. And we're going to take them in reverse order. First, this is the gospel of God. That is a claim about the source. Second, that Paul himself is called to be an apostle who is set apart for the gospel. And this is a claim about the delivery system, how things get from the source to you and me. And third, that Paul, as he takes up this vocation, does so as a servant of the Messiah, Jesus. And this speaks to the reliability of that delivery system. This one verse tells us where the gospel comes from and how God ordained for it to get to you and me. So first, this is the gospel or good news of God. That's the Christian claim. God is the source and the origin of this gospel. And that means something very important. This was not our idea. This is not the culmination of all human intellect and learning and searching after God that finally produced this amazing reality. This is not the height of our best thinking about God and spirituality. No, according to the Christian claim, according to the plan of God from all eternity, this gospel erupts into history, into the midst of history, into the very midst of humanity, from God himself in the person of his son, Jesus. And it has forever shifted reality and what is possible for you and for me. Jesus is, as John's prologue says, the word of God who was with us, who was with God in the beginning and who was God and who was sent to dwell among us. The Nicene Creed, which comes from the fourth century of the history of the church, affirms this about Jesus, that he was God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. And this person entered into history to bear witness to himself and to accomplish in that history the acts of redemption that are so central to this good news. God didn't use an intermediary. God was the method and the message and the medium in the person of his son. He entered the stage and lived and spoke and acted directly in front of human beings like you and me. And he was referred to in that opening chapter of John as light shining in the darkness. This revelation from God to us is like a bolt of lightning at night that, yes, lights up everything around us and startles us, but as it lights up everything around us, we can begin to see through its light. At the 50th anniversary of C.S. Lewis's death, one of the great 20th century apologists or defenders of the Christian faith he was given a memorial stone in Poet's Corner of Westminster Abbey in London. And on this green stone around it are words that are engraved, a quote from this great apologist, which says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. We were in the dark. We were groping. We were trying to understand. That is humanity blinded by the reality of sin. And God brings and bursts into history with his revelation and illuminates the depth of our hearts, his own nature and being and character, and the realities of the world for us to see by his light. G.K. Chesterton, another great apologist from the 20th century, earlier than Lewis, said that he believes in Christianity because he has found Christianity to be a truth-telling thing. It speaks the truth. The source of the gospel is this pure source of God himself. But then the question comes, so it comes how does this gospel get to us? We didn't see the lightning bolt when Jesus entered into history. We weren't there. We didn't walk with him or hear him talk. And neither did those to whom Paul was writing in Rome long ago. So this is addressed by the second point that Paul makes. Again, working backwards. He says that he is called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. Let's go back to Avion and bottled water for a moment. That water from the source in eastern France 
needs a delivery system so that they can get that you know, product that we all need into our mouths. And so this system involves a bottling plant at the source powered by hydroelectricity and organic waste from farms, which is just another way of saying manure, and recycled bottles and boxes and crates and trucks and planes and trains to get that pure source water into your hands on a hot day that you can be refreshed and have what you really need. God, too, authorized a delivery system for the purity of his gospel to reach you and me. And that system is the spirit-empowered witness of these men we called the apostles. It's a fundamental affirmation of our faith, this delivery system. Think about it, already during Jesus' earthly mission, he commissioned people and sent them out to go preach the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom, and to heal. And then after his resurrection, many of you will know, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he commissions his apostles to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything that I have commanded you, he says. That's their job. God wanted all the nations to hear the reality of this gospel. And so he set aside these apostles to be sent. That's what apostle means. Quite simply, it means sent ones. They were sent. They were sent as authorized agents of the God of heaven and earth to proclaim this pure and true and life-changing gospel to you and to me. And that's what Paul says he is as he opens his letter. He is an apostle set apart by God, called by God to do this work of gospel proclamation into the world. The expansion of the church, the company of those who hear this gospel and respond to it personally in a deep response of faith and trust and putting our lives into the hands of this king who is proclaimed in the gospel is built on the testimony of the apostles. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. He talks about the household of God being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And then he says Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. God's pure and unadulterated gospel was entrusted to apostles who in turn, in the power of the Holy Spirit, went out and proclaimed this gospel to the world. Paul, most famously, to the Gentiles. Although, of course, he also began his proclamation among the Jews. He would go to synagogues in the Greco-Roman world. And Peter and James, primarily among the Jews. And we read about this wonderful story of expansion through God's intended delivery system of the apostles' proclamation in the biblical book called The Acts of the Apostles. Now, you might say, though, to me, well, look, I've neither heard Jesus nor have I actually heard the apostles. They died a long time ago. And I would say to you, well, not so fast, not so fast, because to keep this from being one big game of telephone over the centuries with great potential for the gospel, gospel to be distorted and lost by additions or deletions through each successive handing down, God in his inscrutable providence designed a way through the agency of his Holy Spirit to preserve the apostolic testimony that we might have it in its pure and unadulterated form today in what we call the New Testament of our Bible. These 27 books became the the canon, the New Testament, in addition with the Old Testament books, which God also breathed out and inspired. And they became these 27 books based on their connection to apostolic authority. The standard test in the formation of the canon of the Bible was for a work to demonstrate its connection to the apostles in some tangible way. And we believe that these 27 books preserve the authentic, authoritative, spirit-inspired testimony to the gospel that Jesus proclaimed and then entrusted to these faithful men. And there's a whole field of inquiry into the reliability of the biblical text that we call textual criticism that considers the manuscript evidence of the Bible and increases our confidence that even without digital hard drives, it's hard for us to imagine, that what was written early after the time of Jesus in the original manuscripts has been faithfully preserved for us down through the ages. And let me just say one small comment that this is especially true when we consider the biblical manuscript evidence relative to the evidence, manuscript evidence of any other classical work, such as works from Homer or Plato. There's really not a comparison. If you spend much time with us as a church, and I hope that you will, you'll come to know that we cling to the Bible. 
And it's for this reason that we believe that it's here. We have God's own testimony through the pens of many different agents throughout history to his pure and unadulterated gospel that has power. This is why we read from the Bible week after week as we gather together. It's why we preach from this biblical text. It's why in our architecture at the center of our room here, this sanctuary is this pulpit with this Bible opened up upon it. It's because we believe with the believing church throughout the centuries that scripture is the inspired word of God without error in all that it affirms and that it is the primary means through which God exercises his life-giving authority in our lives to form us to be more and more like his son, to be his people. He works through these words. It's this book that preserves and communicates from Genesis to Revelation, the gospel of God from the pure source. And the New Testament in particular gives us the faithful testimony of the apostles, the delivery system that God ordained. So as we take up Romans, or just the first 17 verses of Romans for these next few months, we are hearing God address us through the spirit-appointed and spirit-inspired words of the apostle Paul. This authoritative apostolic testimony that we call the scriptures keeps the message of the gospel clear and free from contamination. It becomes the standard by which we judge and listening to any other person who claims to speak or to write about the true gospel. Does it meet and fit and is it consistent with what God has given us in this word? But how do we know the apostles themselves got it right? How do we know that is that the delivery system that God ordained was in fact reliable? I mean, couldn't they have deluded and said or written things to serve their own interests? Certainly we live, I mean, one of the defining features of this moment in our culture, really around the world, is a distrust of authority. So when we talk about an authoritative message from an authoritative God through an authoritative means that he has appointed, I think probably many of us go, well, look, a lot of authority is just a will to power. Maybe this is just written by, by people who wanted to control other people and silence the people who didn't agree with them. And maybe they actually just said that they were divinely inspired so that they could kind of strengthen their message. You know, you can get this for 1995, and by the way, God backs it up, so you should buy it. <laughs> well, Paul was actually accused of these things in his own day. And that is a discussion that I think merits a lot longer conversation than we have time for right now. But I do want to point to the final point of verse 1 in our text. Paul, a servant or slave of Christ Jesus. That word, doulos, means one who is solely committed to another. And as he fulfills his apostolic vocation of proclaiming the gospel of God, he is doing so under the control of and in the service of the living and risen King Jesus who is at the center of his proclamation. And his heart and his motivation is to not serve himself, not to proclaim himself, not to claim the rights of his own, but he sees himself as one serving another master, a master that he believes is the king, the living king of the world, a master that he knows has radically transformed his own life. Paul is in deep relationship with the Jesus about whom he writes and the Jesus that he serves. Paul's not writing as a detached, neutral observer, and sometimes that makes us suspicious. But I think actually it's Paul's attachment to Jesus, to his subject matter, that makes him rigorous and clear about the fact that he doesn't want to distort that, that which has been entrusted to him. And this needs to be considered as we wrestle with the reliability of his testimony and his witness. It also needs to be seen that Paul's own description of his life is a paradigm for ours. That to come to know this Jesus is to become his servant. And that this is the way to full and true life. This gets into the more of the content of the gospel for later in the series. But let's remember that Paul could not be the servant of Jesus if Jesus had not been the servant of Paul. This king at the center of our gospel is a king who became a slave to all. That we might become his servants and know genuine life. 
So here's what I want to say about the reliability of this delivery system from Paul's own terms. There are, there are three brief observations as we come near to a close. And we'll consider more of this when we come to the expression of the obedience of faith in verse 5 of Romans 1. But let's just make these three brief observations that strengthen our trust in the reliability of the delivery system of the pure gospel to us based on what the apostle claims. First, he says, as a servant, he is passionately concerned about the purity of God's word. When the Galatians were hearing a distorted version of the gospel, Paul got angry, really angry. Read Galatians chapter one. And he said, there is no other gospel, Galatians. And then he said, and I quote, this is not man's gospel. On the contrary, he says he received it through a revelation from Jesus Christ. That is, it is pure and straight from the source, from God himself. In 2 Corinthians, he says that he refuses to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. And in Colossians, he says that the stewardship entrusted to him was to make the word of God fully known. Second, he seeks only to please his king, Jesus. Back in Galatians, Paul asks, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I still trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a slave of Christ. Or in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. And the third point that I would make about the reliability of Paul is that he suffered greatly for this gospel. As he finishes that combative letter to the church in Galatia, he says this, from now on, no, let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul had been whipped five times with 39 lashes for the sake of the gospel. He'd been beaten with rods by the Gentile authorities three times. He'd been shipwrecked, exposed at sea for a night and a day. He lists all of these sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In these sufferings, he would say, claim the authenticity of his apostleship and the sincerity of his motives. And he was not the only apostle to suffer. From what we know, nearly all of them suffered greatly for this work, to proclaim faithfully this gospel. Why? Because they had seen Jesus, because they had encountered Jesus, because they had been watching this gospel transform towns and cities and lives and people. And because they knew, as Paul will go on to say at the end of this introductory statement, that this gospel was the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. They wanted without any, they wanted nothing with, with uh, adulterating this gospel with their own impure thoughts or motives. They wanted to present it purely to those that God had sent them to proclaim it to. They were concerned for the purity of God's word, radically committed to being faithful to God, and they suffered for it. And again, if you're a great skeptic out there, there are arguments that you could make to rebut these points, but I would say to you this. Have you thought about the gospel deeply? Have you wrestled with this gospel? Have you seen just how beautiful and awesome it is? how it explains so much about what exists in your own heart, about the questions that we ask as a culture and a society, about what we long for in terms of being known and loved and having a sense of purpose and identity. This gospel addresses all of these things. And I would go back to say that we, through it, can see everything else, that it is a truth-telling thing, worthy of our consideration and reflection, and not just a quick dismissal. The arguments against the reliability of this gospel have been there since the first centuries. They're nothing new. But yet this gospel has continued to be proclaimed decade after decade, year after year, day after day, Sunday after Sunday, and lives are being transformed before our very eyes because of it, because God's power is unleashed as we proclaim Christ and him crucified, not with fancy words of eloquence and wisdom, but with just a bold demonstration of the spirit and of power. That's our hope. This summer, Mandy and I had some time, we had a little staycation without kids, and we had some time to do some cleaning up of things in our house. And we rediscovered something that we found 10 years ago when we moved into our home in Jamaica Plain and did some renovations. Behind one of the walls that we tore down, I found a postcard. And the postcard had been put in a jar, and I found the jar again this summer. And on the postcard, there was a stamp. 
It was a one cent Benjamin Franklin stamp on the postcard. Now, I don't know anything about stamps. Some of you here probably know a lot about stamps, but I don't know, especially maybe if you're part of the Women's Benevolence Society. I don't know anything about stamps, but I decided that before I threw it away, I'd just do a quick Google search on it, and I searched for it, and lo and behold, this was a one cent Benjamin Franklin stamp that was originally started being printed in 1923. So this was an old postcard. And uh, I discovered very, very quickly that there are some very rare versions of this stamp that are worth in excess of six figures. No joke, you can find them online. And so um, most versions of the stamp aren't worth much at all because they were mostly printed on standard printing presses. But there are a few batches of them that are real diamonds in the rough. And if you know anything about stamps, I'll tell you. The Scott 594 and the Scott 596 version, that's just Greek to me. I don't know what that means. But those are the ones that are worth thousands. Now, we did a little bit more research and figured out that we have one of the run-of-the-mill one-cent Benjamin Franklin stamps. <laughs> but for a while there, I was thinking, I found my kid's college fund in the wall. This is amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I want you to know that the gospel of God is like that one cent rare stamp. There are so many others like it out in the world. You will hear gospel after gospel after gospel. You hear them every day. Stories and narratives that are wooing you to allegiance. That you can fix the things that are broken in your life by taking up this program, by buying this for 1995, by engaging in this kind of education, by being part of this club. And you know what? They're worth the one cent. But there is a true gospel that's broken into the world from a source that has never been tainted by unholiness or impurity. From a source that is so pure and holy and righteous and true that to see him face to face is to fall on your knees and cry out, I am not worthy. And that source loves you deeply, wants you to know him personally, and has come to rescue you from yourself and from all the other false gospels that you hear in the world today that will just enslave you even though they promise you freedom. It is so valuable, six figures doesn't even come close. It is worth your life and mine. Let's pray. How we thank you, O oh God, that you have burst into the darkness with a light so beautiful and pure and true. Thank you for the witness of the Apostle Paul that you have preserved for us in the texts of Scripture. Thank you, Lord, that we are not left to stumble. Thank you that you have been merciful to people that you have made in your image, but we have rejected you. Thank you that you have not rejected us. Lord, I pray that we would be a people rooted in and defined by the reality of your gospel. I pray for those here this morning investigating, resisting, that you, Lord, would woo them by the beauty of this gospel. I pray for all of us who follow you that you would deepen our confidence in this gospel that is your power for salvation for everyone who believes. May we not be ashamed of this amazing gift that you have given to us. We love you. Bless, Lord, your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.